Yes. Just a reminder, Doctor, you're still under oath. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Nelson. Good afternoon, Dr. Tobin. Hello, Mr. Nelson. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here with us today. We'll take a sip. Cheers. Like they Cheers. do in Ireland, right? Yep. Ah, all right. So I just want to kind of review a few things with you, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think we'll take too long, but um, so you were ultimately approached by the state of Minnesota to assist them uh, in the review of the medical issues in this case, correct? Correct. And uh, you have volunteered to do this work uh, at no cost, correct? Correct. And that's, uh, you're not uh, normally involved in criminal cases of this nature, correct? Correct. And this is the first time you've ever been involved in a criminal case, correct? Correct. And it was that reason that you decided uh, not to charge a fee, correct? Correct. Now, when you are in other cases, what type of fee do you normally charge? I charge per hour, so it's... What's your hourly rate? And my hourly rate is 500 an hour for EU material. Okay. Um, and But you b agreed to waive your hourly rate for this time, correct? correct? Um, you felt it was an important case, right? Yes. All right. Now, in preparation uh, for your testimony today, you met with the state numerous times, correct? Correct. You have had the opportunity to review uh, all of the medical information that was obtained in this case, correct? Yes. That would include Mr. Floyd's previous medical history, correct? Correct. The autopsy and attending uh, toxicology reports that were prepared in uh, this case? Yes. As well as some investigative materials, police reports, things of that nature, correct? Correct. And just to correct me if I'm wrong, but you're not a pathologist, correct? Correct. I am not a pathologist. Your specialty is in pulmonology, critical care, things of that nature? Correct. And then you also have an interest and, uh, and uh, uh, an impressive resume relevant to applied physiology as well. Correct. And you've been honored um, quite extensively for your work in that regard, right? Correct. Um, you're not a Minneapolis police officer. Correct. It's fair to say that the training that is provided by the Minneapolis Police Department in terms of medical care comes nowhere close to your level of expertise. Correct. Right? You understand that Minneapolis police officers are not even EMTs. Correct. They have a basic life-saving certificate dealing with gunshots, chest seals, tourniquets, and CPR, right? My, yes. Right. So you're, uh, you've also had the opportunity uh, to review a lot of the body camera footage, correct? Yes. You've done, um, I think you testified that you've watched these videos hundreds of times. Correct. And you've watched them all from all different angles, correct? Correct. And you've had the luxury of slowing things down, moving it into slow motion, still framing various times, right? Correct. And <clears throat> so your analysis of this case comes after hundreds, if not thousands of hours of time spent looking at this information. I don't know the total amount of time that I've spent, but it's substantial. Right. So then you uh, ultimately, based on the review of all of that, you prepared a report, correct? Correct. And you provided that to the state of Minnesota in late January of this year, right? January 27th, yeah. Right. And after that, you've had numerous meetings with uh, the prosecution team in this case? And, and by phone or by Zoom, yeah. Right. Um, including January 30th of this year? I, I don't know the dates, but I mean, that sounds correct. Right. So if I were to tell you the dates were January 30th, March 3rd, March 9th, March 17th, March 21st, April 6th, and April 7th, you would not have uh, any reason to dispute me. I have no reason to dispute And you understand that notes are made of those meetings and provided to the defense in this case, correct? I understood that. And then you've also been able to spend a substantial period of time preparing the, the exhibits that the jury was able to see earlier today, right? Correct. And uh, those were all prepared by you or someone within your team, right? They're prepared by me, yeah. And uh, you provided those to the prosecution in advance of today's testimony? Correct. And you understand those were provided to me last night? 
I, I, I have no idea when. But, okay. Yep. All right. So you've you've had a lot of time to prepare uh, both yourself as well as the prosecution team in connection with this case. Fair to say? Correct. Now you talked quite a bit about physics in uh, your direct testimony. Agreed? Yes. And you would agree that <clears throat> physics or the application of physical forces is a constantly changing uh, set of circumstances. I, I didn't catch what you said. Sure. You would agree with me, would you not, that when you look at the concepts of physics, these things are constantly changing, right? Yeah, all science is constant changing. Constant. I mean, yes. in, in milliseconds and nanoseconds, right? Yes. And so if I put this much weight or this much weight, all of the, the formulas and variations will, will change from second to second, millisecond to millisecond, nanosecond to nanosecond. Agreed? I agree. Similarly, biology sort of works the same way, right? Yes. My heart beats, my lungs breathe, my brain is sending millions of signals to my body at all times. Correct. Again, even, I mean, faster than the speed of light, right? Correct. Millions of signals every nanosecond, right? Yes. And I think in your report, you even kind of discuss that when you're talking about these instances, when you're talking about the physics or the biology, what you're really talking about is a single kind of nanosecond. But all of these processes are working in concert at all times, right? Right. I mean, the way we calculated is the mean value. But I mean, it, it's then into one instant. Right. You've, you've, you've taken this case and you've literally boiled it down into a nanosecond. Oh, I wouldn't say that, no, because it's obviously in my report, as you see, it's sequentially, there's a whole chronology. I begin from the time the knee is placed on the neck and then all the time until uh, what's happening in Hennepin County ER. Right. And so you, you talk, your report talks about the sequential nature of things, but when we talk about the biology and the physics of this case, these things are working simultaneously, contemporaneously, all together, right? That's correct. In yeah. an incredibly rapid fashion. Yes. And you would agree with me that, that as this incident was occurring, there was nobody measuring the units of force that were placed on any particular position of any particular person at any particular moment, right? I mean, there was nobody there measuring them at the time. I agree that. But, but they're all calculable. Understood. And that's when you calculate them, what you have to do is you have to boil it down into what you would call the mean or the average, right? Correct. And so in, whenever we look at the concept of an average, there are things that are happening moments before, moments after, right? Yes. And forces will increase or decrease relative to the nanosecond of time. Agreed? Correct. Yep. Yeah. And ultimately, when we talk about kind of the biology of things, a pathologist tries to look at all the intersection of all of the things that occur to a particular, in a particular death investigation, correct? But, I mean, they're not looking at anything to do physiology. Understood. But they're also looking at how other uh, factors may contribute to the death of an individual, right? I mean, they're basically yes looking... No, sir. Sorry? It's a yes or no, sir, so I'm objecting. Well, uh, uh, yes, partly. Yeah. They're looking at things beyond a nanosecond. Agreed? No, no I, I mean, I think in terms of a pathologist, they're looking at, at a nanosecond. They're looking at the nanosecond of death. Right. But they're taking into consideration things simply that, that extend beyond physiology, right? I mean, they're lo looking primarily at pathology. Right. So what causes the heart to stop? What causes <clears throat> the lungs to cease to function, etc. right? They're making an, an inference based on a pathological time point. Right. Considering a multitude of biological factors 
that are involved in the death of a person, right? I mean, it's the same as any, any physician is looking at a multitude of factors. So in terms, again, <clears throat> of your review, um, you would agree that the amount of time that you've spent looking at videos, analyzing these videos from different perspectives and angles, is far greater than the length of this incident. Yes. Probably to the times a thousand. I can't. I, I really don't know. But, I mean, but it's, it's substantially longer than the incident. And ultimately, you conclude that Mr. Floyd uh, died as a, uh, what we would call a hypoxic death. He died of a low level of oxygen. Right. That there was a low level of oxygen that caused damage to the brain, which resulted in a pulseless electrical activity, correct? Not quite. How did you phrase it? That's um, he, he had a low level of oxygen that caused damage to the brain. The brain didn't cause the pulseless electrical alternates. So the low level of oxygen caused both. The low level of oxygen caused the damage to the brain. The low level of oxygen separately caused the pulses electrical alternates. So it's an example of how multiple processes are occurring simultaneously. Well, not really. It's just one process. It's a low level of oxygen that's doing both. That's having an effect on multiple, uh, multi the heart and the brain and the lungs, right? Uh, not really. It's just two. Okay. The brain and the heart. The brain and the heart. All right. Now you talked about, I think you called it the, ner is it the nuchal ligament? Did yes. I just, am I saying that correct? Correct. Yeah. Right. That's that space at the back of the neck that's mm. very, very hard, right? It's, it's not so much a space. I mean, it's a long bit, but it, it's roughly the palm of your hand. You stick the palm of your hand at the back of your neck. Right. And you're right over the nuchal ligament. Right. And that's a, you said, a very, very hard surface, right? Yeah. Can withstand yeah. a great amount of pressure, right? Correct. And, uh, <clears throat> and so when we talk about the placement of the knee, there would be periods of time where Mr. Chauvin's knee was placed at that nuchal ligament, based on your Correct. observation of the yes. videos. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Not that goes both ways. And you've had an opportunity to review the autopsy, correct? I did, yeah. Right. You understand um, that there was no bruising either atop the skin or under the, the skin surfaces that were noted by Dr. Baker? Yes, I'm aware. And you also are aware, uh, you talked quite a bit about the hypopharynx, right? Yes. And you're aware that the hypopharynx was photographed at autopsy and no injury was noted? I'm aware. Now, I found, I found it very interesting uh, in your testimony and your report when you're kind of talking about this notion of if you can't speak or if you can speak, it doesn't mean you can, or, sorry, I have to say, if you can speak, you can breathe, yeah. right? Um, and you describe this as a very dangerous proposition, right? Yes. yes. You describe this as causing a false sense of security to people, right? That's how Correct. you yep. And in fact, in your report, you actually uh, write a paragraph about how physicians oftentimes uh, have trouble with this, right? Yes. And so people who have similar to yourself attended medical school, mm -hmm. right? Yep. You, I'm sorry, you have to say yes. Yep. I'm sorry, terribly sorry. No yeah. problem. Yes. Um, so, in, you know, intelligent men and women who've graduated from college, gone on to medical school, and... Uh, are engaged in the practice of medicine sometimes uh, have problems with this notion, right? Yes. They, a patient comes in and says that they're having trouble breathing and oftentimes a physician will uh, not believe them, essentially. It's, it's important, Mr. Nelson, I, to make sure we're, we're talking about speech or difficulty in breathing because they're different. Right. Well, you, you, you write in your report that some doctors incorrectly consider patients to be hysterical. Your Honor, may we approach? Let's see this, Your Honor. Your Honor, the uh, reference to the report is hearsay. It's not evidence. It's not property. from it. Overruled. You wrote in your report that some doctors incorrectly consider patients hysterical and the symptoms yes. imaginary in nature, which further aggregates patient distress. 
right? Yes, yes, I recall. And you wrote that this view represents a physician's failure to understand the fundamental cause of a clinical disorder. Right, but I'm talking about a different thing there. That's hyperventilation syndrome. So somebody comes in... Which is in, very different than the difficulty with speech. They're, they're really apples and oranges. Okay. But if physicians, right, someone comes in and they're yeah. hyperventilating and they articulate to their physician, yes. I can't breathe, yes. right? And it's hyperventilation syndrome, right? Yes. And physicians oftentimes, as you indicate, yes. confuse this issue. Correct. They blame the patient, right? Or I don't have to blame the patient, but I mean, they, they certainly miss the diagnosis. And it's a kind of a, when we're talking about speaking and breathing simultaneously, yes. which is a different consideration. Um, if uh, a Minneapolis police lieutenant who trains police officers happened to have testified that that's a common statement in the course of treatment or in the course of training of Minneapolis police officers, you might take exception with that statement. I, I, I didn't follow your question. <clears throat> it's very hard to hear through that plexiglass. I under, uh, and I'm losing my voice, I think. Excuse me. If a Minneapolis police officer, yeah. try to talk closer to the mic, mm -hmm. the Minneapolis police lieutenant who trains Minneapolis police officers testified that it is frequently said and trained to police officers that a person can talk, it means they can breathe. You would have a problem with that. You would yes, I mean, they're able to breathe at that moment in time, but 10 seconds later, they may be dead. Right. And because <clears throat> dealing with any person is a rapidly evolving situation that can change from second to second. Yes. Now, in terms of the calculations that you've made, um, you would agree that your calculations are generally theoretical, correct? No, they're not theoretical. I mean, they're based on direct measurements. They're based on extensive research. But you're making certain assumptions in the application of that science, are you not? Very few assumptions. You're assuming the weight of Mr. Chauvin. Right, I'm aware. So, I mean, obviously I'm aware that there's two different weights that are given. Right. And you're assuming the weight of the uh, equipment that the officer wears. Yes. And you've not actually ever physically measured the weight of the equipment a police officer carries, correct? No. I mean, I, I took the, the measurements that are reported. And you're not actually weighing what Mr. <clears throat> Chauvin weighed on May 25th of 2020. No. And in your measurements, you're all, you, are, you appear to be, at least from my understanding, which is going to be limited, but from my understanding is that your measurements assumed an equal weight distribution between the right and the left legs. It, 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 yes, that, that's correct. All right. And so again, as we know, as things change and evolve and flow, that's, weight is pretty frequently redistributed, right? That is correct. And again, in terms of the uh, EELV, am I yes. saying that right? The EELV, that's the you and expiratory lung volume. All right. You're also um, basing that um, those calculations on the presumption that a person is a healthy individual, right? For the ELV, it's not going to change, really. But in terms of the normal respiratory rate, excuse me, some of the other uh, factors that you put into your analysis, it's all premised upon a healthy individual, right? Right. It's ba based on a 46-year-old person of a particular height and sex, yes. Right. Uh, who's healthy. Correct. Right. Um, and so you would agree if biology can change rapidly, <laughs> uh, right. that the biological, uh, the specific biological conditions of Mr. Chauvin and or Mr. Floyd come into play, right? Correct. And those volumes or those 
figures that you've assessed in connection with this case, <clears throat> they are um, conditioned upon him being a healthy individual. Right. I mean, it, it varies in terms of the lungs. I mean, say, for example, compliance will vary, but end expiratory lung volume is pretty robust. It okay. just isn't going to vary. Okay, so some, but other factors, like you said, what was the first sentence? Lung compliance will vary from, from one person to the next person, but it, it varies di different segments within the lung. They're not all monolithic. Okay. Now, and you, you talked about one thing in terms of, and this is a little bit of an aside, but in terms of your, the prone position and yeah. the pushing of the stomach into the lungs, right? Yes. Um, the size of a person's stomach yeah. has some bearing on that, right? It does. A person like myself who has a few extra inches, if I'm prone, it's going to perhaps push further or harder up into my lungs, right? Yes. A person who is healthy, physical, uh, muscular, it's going to have less of an impact. That is correct. All right. But again, in terms of what we have learned about Mr. Floyd from his autopsy and his medical records, is that we understand that Mr. Floyd had some heart disease, right? That is correct. In fact, I believe uh, that he had uh, in some of his arteries somewhere between a 75 and 90 percent occlusion of his ventricular arteries, right? Correct. And that's going to affect blood flow in a, in a person, right? It's going to make the body work a little harder to get the blood through the body. Not, no, not really. It's not going to do that. Okay. There's, how does that affect a person's respiratory? The, the coronary artery? Mm -hmm. If the coronary artery is affecting it, and if the coronary artery was contributing to shortness of breath, you would expect that he would be complaining of chest pain, and you would be expect that he would be demonstrating a very rapid respiratory rate. We don't see either. Okay. Um, we'll come back to the res re res respiration. Res I can't say it. I'm, I'm taken by your accent. Uh, the resp I, respiratory I, I, rate. I can't compensate for it. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, his, I'll say it like you, his respiratory rate. Okay. There you go. All right. We also, we also understand that Mr. Floyd, based on his medical records, has a history of hypertension or high blood pressure. Right? Yes, that's correct. Now, in terms of, uh, we also understand that Mr. Floyd had previously been diagnosed with COVID-19, right? Correct. And he may not be symptomatic, have been symptomatic on March 25th, but it's fair to say that um, a lot is unknown about the effects of COVID-19 on a person's lungs, long term. I mean, n not as much as it would appear to be the case. I mean, because obviously it's a viral illness. We have a, a huge amount of information about the long term effects of viral illnesses. And those can affect <clears throat> the elasticity of the lungs, right? Not the elasticity. It would be, if it's having any effect, it would be within the sensory receptors within the trachea bronchial three. So it really wouldn't have anything to do with the elasticity. Okay. Now, but we also learned quite a bit about the toxicology as well. Oh, excuse me. On the COVID-19, you testified that um, treatment of people with COVID-19 includes leaving them in the prone position, right? Correct. And so those people who would be treated for COVID-19 in the prone position, based on your calculations, you would have a 24% decrease in the EELV. Right. I mean, the, this is people with COVID where they're during the time that they have COVID. Right. But right. You, that's yeah. what you'd expect, that same decrease in the EELV. No, mm -hmm. it's going to be very different in somebody who has, say, pneumonia what's going to happen in the prone position will be very variable from one person to the other as a result of the, of the pneumonia. It's different than normal lungs. Okay. So, so <clears throat> in essence, every person is different. Oh, for certain. And now, uh, you calculated uh, his respiratory rate to be 22, right? Correct. And you said that that was within the normal respiratory rate? Yep. And um, you would not describe him as hyperventilating? 
and the word hyperventilation is open to an awful lot of misinterpretation. That is most certainly not hyperventilation. No. And hyperventilation assists in the removal of carbon dioxide from the, from the body, right? It's confusing. It's not, it's not that simple. In its simplest terms. But in the simplest terms, yes, it does assist. It, it, it gets rid of carbon dioxide. But now, it can be frequently misleading. Okay. Now, in terms of the toxicology of Mr. Uh, Floyd, we did learn that um, there were some controlled substances in his system, right? Yes. Uh, we know that there was, for example, um, nicotine, right? Yes. Mr. Floyd was a smoker. Correct. Right? And smoking changes the lung function, agreed? In some people. Now, we also learned uh, more, and, and I'm not suggesting that people who, all people who smoke have lung problems, right? Less than 10% do. 90% don't have any. Can I use from the microphone? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No problem. So, we, you focused in your direct examination quite a bit in terms of um, fentanyl and the fentanyl's effect on the res respiration rate. Yes. And you would agree generally that fentanyl uh, is a respiratory depressant. It can be. Right. Um, it, it's a it's a used in operating rooms, right? Yes. For yep. And it's also used in the management of chronic pain, right? That is correct. And medically speaking, those are really the only two reasons that fentanyl would be prescribed. Yes, probably. Um, <clears throat> But you understand that fentanyl has become far more prolific in street drugs, right? Yes, I'm aware. And there's a, you would agree generally that there is a significant difference between fentanyl that's manufactured according to the United States, you know, uh, their uh, whatever rules apply, right? The, the, the pharmaceutical companies make it much differently than the street dealers do, right? I, I imagine so. Right. Um, and so when you are, when a person is ingesting illicit street purchased fentanyl, it's, it's a, every time they take a fentanyl dose, it's a different experience for that person. Right, but it, if, if it's affecting the respiratory center, it's going to act through the mu receptors in the medulla oblongata. There's no way around that. Right. It's not, if fentanyl isn't going to have an effect on respiration by some other mechanism. Understood. But the end result of fentanyl can include Respir respiratory depression. Right, through the mu receptors. Right. And we also learned that there was methamphetamine in a low dose in Mr. Uh, Floyd's system, right? Correct. And the fentanyl and the methamphetamine, they can kind of counteract each other, right? Well, I mean, they're upward and downwards, but I mean, but in terms of the respiratory centers, there is not going to be. So the methamphetamine would not I mean, the methamphetamine is going to increase the heart rate, right? That's a different thing than the respiratory symptoms. Understood, yeah. but that's going to, methamphetamine will increase a person's heart rate, right? Yes. That's one of the side effects. Yes. And there are a few uh, lawfully, uh, there are a few conditions where a physician can lawfully prescribe methamphetamine, right? Yes. But it's exceedingly rare that it's actually done. I, mean, I can't say, but I mean, it, it's definitely a prescribable agent, kind of. It used to be used commonly for appetite suppressant. And uh, I think um, ADHD, is that yes. right? Yes. Okay. So, <clears throat> we also know that adrenaline will increase the heart rate, right? Yes. And adrenaline can be put into the body in, <clears throat> in multiple ways, right? Well, sure. let me, let me, there are many things that can cause a surge in adrenaline. Yes. One of those things would be getting into a fight with someone. Yes. Or being afraid. Difficult to know in terms of being afraid, but getting into a fight. And the paraganglia, paraganglionoma that was found I understand you call it the 10% tumor, but in 10% of the tumor cases, that can cause an adrenaline surge. Uh, yes, and in the 90% it won't. 
Now, <clears throat> in terms of the use of fentanyl in the hospital setting, surgical setting, uh, have you become familiar with a uh, what's called wooden chest syndrome? Yes, I have. And can you explain for the jury what wooden chest in, syndrome is? In some patients with fentanyl, you'll get an increase in chest wall stiffness. So the lungs become less elastic? Not quite the lungs, the chest wall. Okay. So that would prevent a, a chest wall tight or chest wall rigidity will also uh, decrease the performance of the lungs. It will imp impede the ability of the lungs to impact to expand. Now, <clears throat> in your report, you wrote that you would expect the peak respiratory depression to occur from fentanyl within five minutes of ingestion. Right. right. Yeah. And um, have you come to learn that uh, tablets were found or, or controlled substances were found in the back seat of Squad 320? I mean, I've heard reports to that effect. I don't know what the, the status of it is. All right. So you were not, you've not been provided with any additional information since the time you've prepared your report? I, no, I, I'm sure that's wrong, but I, I've been provided with a lot of information. I don't necessarily recall, keep it all sure. at, the, at the front of my brain. Okay. Well, <clears throat> yesterday we heard um, testimony from state crime lab that there were in the back seat of the squad car two partially consumed pills found in the back of squad 320. Objection, Your Honor, to the characterization of testimony. To the characterization of? I'll overrule the, if it's foundational to your It is. <clears throat> you understand that? No. I said, okay. I kind of, but not fully. Yesterday, a chemist from the state crime lab okay. testified in this case. Counsel, I'm going to reverse my ruling. It's, it's sustained. You can state in the form of a hypothetical, however. Uh, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Can we? I can't hear you. The sidebar. Let me ask <clears throat> let me ask you in the form of a hypothetical question okay if partially ingested pills that were determined to contain uh, both fentanyl and methamphetamine were found partially ingested in the back seat of a squad of the squad car and that those pills had been <clears throat> had come had the DNA of the in, of the deceased individual on them, meaning that they took them, mm -hmm. and those pills would have been in his mouth at about two eighteen or twenty eighteen, right? Mm -hmm. Is it fair to say that you would expect the peak fentanyl respiratory depression within about five minutes? Right. I mean, obviously, it would depend on how much of it was ingested. I mean, it, just finding the pills won't tell you anything about whether any of it was ingested or some of it or anything. But if, what, if there was any amount of it ingested, yes, the peak would be five minutes. Right. And so if it happened at 2018 or thereabouts when the individual was in the back of the car, mm -hmm. you would expect that peak respiratory depression to be around 2013, right? 20, I thought, no, 2023, I'm sorry. 2018 to 2023 is You're five. trying to really confuse me, Mr. Nelson. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I think I can actually say it's been a long week now. Uh, so 
2018 is the ingestion point. You would expect peak respiratory depression by 2023. Correct. Right? That's the peak, meaning that it could continue afterwards, right? Right. All right. You also described in your direct testimony um, what you have interpreted to, to be an anoxic seizure, right? Yes. At 2024. Correct. 24, 21. 20, 24. 21. 21. And that was in uh, what you uh, saw and what the jury was played was reflected in, in from Officer Lane's body camera, right? Correct. And it was the kick of the legs, right? Yes. And after that point, you can see Officer Lane hold the leg down, right? Yes. And you can see it kick up again, yes. right? Once again, try not to over each other. Sorry. A tendency to go fast. That's what you recognize based on your 46 years of being a pulmonologist and an intensivist and in your experience, right? right? I mean, obviously there was additional information from the hand, but I mean, but it, the, the leg was the key. Right. And <clears throat> it would be reasonable for a police officer to interpret that same behavior as resistance. Objection, Your Honor. Foundation of witness to talk about what's reasonable for a police officer. This is now, you testified that the last breath of Mr. Floyd was at 20, 25, 16, right? Correct. Prior to that point, to all people who were there and monitoring him, he would have appeared to have been breathing, right? I didn't, I, it's just hard for me to hear. Sorry. Prior to that point, yeah. it would be uh, reasonable that he would appear to be breathing, right? Yes. And in fact, you showed us a segment where you could were able to count his respiratory rates. Yes. Right? And then you said that at 2035 and 06 seconds is when the first air was pumped back into him. Correct. All right. And you understand that paramedics arrived at 20, 27, and 45 seconds? Yes. And so the time between the, when the paramedics arrived and Mr. Uh, Floyd got his first air was roughly eight minutes, almost nine minutes. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And according to timelines, the drive to the hospital is about five minutes. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the that. Were you aware that the, t the drive to the hospital is about five minutes? I, I wasn't aware, but I have no reason to dispute it. And so between 20, 27 and 45 seconds when the EMTs first arrived and the time they got him to uh, have an air in his lungs, that was a crucial nine minutes. Yes. Uh, Your Honor, I have nothing for you. Mr. Blackwell. Dr. Tobin, just a, a few questions, just for clarification's sake. Uh, you would just ask a lot of questions about science and medicine, changing, constantly changing, evolving by the nanosecond, by the millisecond. You heard all of that. Yes, I did. Um, I want to go to the period of time when Mr. Chauvin was on the back and neck of Mr. Floyd. Yes. Did you see uh, him get off of the back of Mr. Floyd by the nanosecond, by the millisecond, by any seconds in the nine minutes and 29 seconds that you saw him on? No, I did not. If you look at the five minutes and three seconds that you focused on, where, if you consider all the nanoseconds and milliseconds in the five minutes and three seconds, where was Mr. Chauvin the vast majority of that time? He was on Mr. Floyd's neck and uh, on his back and arm. Right, not constantly changing. No. Uh, now, you were asked questions about what injuries were noted on autopsy. Yes. 
And uh, I think a uh, reference was made, there was no injury noted to the hypopharynx on autopsy. Correct. Does that make any difference to you whatsoever? None whatsoever. I wouldn't expect there to be anything found there and, and why at not? autopsy. Why not, Dr. Tolan? Because the effects on the hypopharynx are not something that is going to remain at the time of an autopsy. I mean, the type of changes that we see, say, in somebody with sleep apnea, that's not something you're going to see the following morning when you look at somebody. It's just not there. Well, there was also a reference made to the absence of bruising on the neck during autopsy. Yes. Does that make any difference to you whatsoever? No, because obviously I go to, whenever I go to church, I sit on a hard bench. I don't get bruising of my buttocks when I leave. So it, I wouldn't expect anything in terms of that. So if you have somebody, this was a static force. It's not, a, it's not as if somebody is jamming against it. So you wouldn't expect anything in the way of bruising. And scientifically, do you know of any correlation between the presence or absence of bruising on autopsy and the forces necessary to restrict breathing? No, they're totally different because it's in terms of static forces and dynamic. What about low oxygen? If somebody has, uh, suffers or dies from low oxygen, yes. does that show up on autopsy? No, it does not. And the fact that it doesn't, does that mean anything to you whatsoever? has no meaning. And why not? Because low oxygen is a functional thing, just like an arrhythmia is a functional thing. It doesn't, sh it doesn't leave a fingerprint on the autopsy. It's just there. It's something that happened. It's, uh, but it won't r leave any fingerprint afterwards. You don't see it. But does it mean that the person didn't die from low oxygen? No, absolutely not. So if you take a, a, somebody and you suffocate them with a pillow, and it's very clear to you after you suffocated the person and he's dead from the pillow, you're not going to see the effects of the low oxygen. Now, you were uh, asked quite a few questions about Mr. Floyd's pre-existing health conditions. Correct. And remember, he cited a number of those. Yes. Uh, do any of those conditions have anything to do with the cause of Mr. Floyd's death, in your professional opinion, whatsoever? None whatsoever. And uh, again, what was the cause such that those conditions don't matter? The cause of death is a low level of oxygen that caused the brain damage and caused the heart to stop. You were also asked questions about substances in Mr. Floyd's system. I think you were asked questions about nicotine. Remember that? Yes. He didn't die from nicotine, did he? <laughs> no. Uh, you were asked questions about fentanyl and meth. Yes. Uh, any evidence that he died from meth? No, none. Uh, you were asked questions about um, whether he had ingested any fentanyl within five minutes of his time of death. Yes. Now, I, th I think you explained to us that if somebody is suffering from a fentanyl overdose, you would see a depression in the respiratory system. Yes. And, and depression means some reduction in the rate of ability to breathe. Correct. Did you see any depression in Mr. Floyd's ability to breathe whatsoever before he went unconscious? No, absolutely not. He was normal respiratory rate. Any evidence then that any fentanyl in his system depressed his breathing in any way whatsoever? No, and that's further borne out in the carbon dioxide. Right. Thank you, Dr. Tolkien. No further okay. questions. Anything further? Uh, two very quick questions. In terms of the carbon dioxide level, um, you testified that it was at a 96? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. I didn't catch you. You testified that the carbon dioxide was at a 96? I think it was 89. 89. It was also measured at 102. Do you remember? Well, that's the venous one. But not the arterial is the one you need to look at. And in terms of um, the ingestion of, or just generally speaking, Fentanyl can also cause death as a result of low oxygen to the brain, right? But it would have to be low through respiratory depression. Right. The question is, fentanyl can also cause a death as a result of low oxygen. Well, your answer is yes, but only in part. Okay. Fair enough. Thanks. Just Briefly. One, just one Mr. Nelson brought up again fentanyl as a cause of death. Yes. Uh, doctor, 
You're familiar with the way people die from fentanyl. Yes, very. Do they or do they not go into a coma before they die from a fentanyl overdose? Yes, they will. Was Mr. Floyd ever in a coma? No. Thank you, Dr. Tobin. Okay. Anything else? Thank you. Doctor, thank you so much. Thank you uh, you are much. excused. Okay, thank you. Let's take a five-minute break so we can all get our voices back.